Welcome, everybody, to another episode of MongoDB TV Cloud Connect. I'm Shane McAllister. I work in the developer relations team here at MongoDB, and I'm the host for Cloud Connect, which streams every Thursday at roughly this time, give or take. And we stream on what's good and exciting in the world of all things developer related. And today's show is no different. We're going to dive into an exhilarating world where we're going to be using Google's Gemma open model, newly released, barely a few weeks old, Hugging Face and MongoDB to create a cutting edge AI solution and example. But first, some housekeeping. So while we gear up for today's stream, as I said in the comments there, please drop a shout out in the chat. Tell us where you're joining us from. And we love hearing from all of our fantastic viewers all around the world. And once the show kicks off itself, please add any questions or any comments that you have for me and our guest um, into the chat as well, too. And we'll do our best to answer them live. And if we don't get a chance to answer them live, we'll take care of them at the end as well, too. So please chalk away. This is a live session for a reason. We do love to get the comments in from our viewers. So if you're a seasoned viewer and you've joined us before, we do welcome you back. It's great to see you again. Um, and if you're brand new, we're well, warm welcome to you. All of our past shows for Cloud Connect and indeed the other shows that we do on MongoDB TV are all up on our YouTube channel. You can go into our live playlist there and see what's there. They're also in the past events section of LinkedIn as well too. As ever, this live stream is being recorded. So if you can't stay for all of it and life drags you away, et cetera, don't worry. You can catch the recording later at your leisure. And of course, once you're on YouTube or LinkedIn looking at this, don't forget the golden rule. On YouTube, please like and subscribe to our channel. And seriously, why haven't you so far? Um, and on LinkedIn, please follow us to get all the latest posts and hottest news from MongoDB uh, directly to you as an alert. So one more announcement before we get the show underway. Every year, MongoDB has what we call MongoDB.local events. And we're just about to start them again, bringing them to cities, hopefully near you all over the world. Our first event, our first stop is in Toronto on April 17th. And then we're in May 2nd, we're in New York, our largest dot .local. So additional cities will be added throughout the rest of the year. So if you can't make Toronto, you can't make New York, don't worry, you can go to the website and find out where those other cities are. But if you are interested in joining for our viewers and our developer community, if you use the code on the .local website of community50, so community50, all one word, but the 50 is a, a five and a zero at the end, you will get 50% off your registration for uh, mongodb.local, wherever that happens to be. So with all of that out of the way, let's get on with the show. And today, I'm really delighted to have the brilliant Richmond Aleke here to join us. Richmond joined MongoDB just two and a half, three months ago, and he's gonna shed light on building a sophisticated retrieval augmented generation system, or RAG as it's called, using Google's Gemma open model, which as I said at the beginning, super new, only announced less than a month ago, and embedding models from Hugging Face and utilizing MongoDB's vector search as the database. So we're going to get ready to unravel the synergies between all of these powerful technologies, and you're going to discover yourself how easy it is to get up and running with Richmond's step-by-step -step approach. So without further ado, Richmond, welcome to the show. Welcome to Cloud Connect. Hi, Shane. Um, thanks for having me. And you mentioned that Gemma came out just a few months ago, and I'm not going to lie. It feels like it's been more than that. The, 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 the pace of AI is very quick. And the way the way that this domain moves is is at the speed of innovation. So yeah, it feels like several months to me. Excellent. Well, look, as I said, you are only recently joined us here in MongoDB. Why don't you tell us your, I suppose, career path to date? Where have you been? What have you been doing? And then bring us right up to date. What are you doing in MongoDB? Okay. Uh, well. I can start from the past. I used to be a web developer for a few years, maybe about two, three years. Then I caught the AI bug like everyone else, um, went back to university to get a master's in what if essentially is AI, came out of a master's, uh, worked as a computer vision engineer, 
and then for a few years then a machine learning architect at a consultancy and now i'm a developer advocate at mongodb but advocacy is something that i've been doing for several years so um you can see some content i've put out on youtube or on medium or on nvidia or on o'reilly so um now i get to do something i used to do for free as my job which is excellent <laughs> I think that's how many developers ad, advocates start out, right? They, exactly. they, you know, they're they're a developer. They love to teach. They love to illustrate. They love to explain. They attend some conferences. They kind of go, "Hmm, I've got a story to tell. I wouldn't mind being up on that stage and being able to, you know, illustrate to people what I've been doing." And all of a sudden, as you say, you end up doing a lot of this stuff for free, and then the aha moment comes where you go. This is actually a job as well in some companies. How do I go about doing that? So we're delighted to have you here at MongoDB and particularly delighted to have, I suppose, your expertise in, in AI and machine learning for many. And we've done a lot of these generative AI episodes of Cloud Connect now. But I suppose for many, not developers per se, but certainly in the public eye, Generative AI is, is just a baby. It's it's less than eighteen months old, etc. And and but growing the pace. How did you get into the machine learning space so early and back in the day as well too? What drew you to that first? That's a that's a good question. So like I said, I used to be in uh, web technology, um, building website uh, using a mean stack, uh, which was my first introduction to Mongo, which is yeah. almost about ten years ago. Um, so yeah, uh, the main stack and just working with a lot of web application, you start to realize that they need some form of data. You get introduced to Mongo, then there's, there's some form of intelligence that you need to incorporate within your web application, whether it's search or some form of uh, it, essentially what is AI. And that led me to the domain of exploring this topic. And I bought, and Shane, I bought this huge book. It's probably back in my library. A book? What's that? What's a book? <laughs> What's a book? Exactly. <laughs> I bought a huge book um, just to learn AI. And that book scared me, scared me well enough for me to quit being a web developer and go straight to university to do a master's. And I, because I thought to myself, wow, I don't understand anything in this book. This must be serious. So I took it a bit seriously and I went back into, um, into uni. And now you can learn Gen AI on a YouTube video like this. Very good, very good. And I'm just conscious. I, I I think we I see a you know a couple of hundred viewers on LinkedIn, which is superb. Great to see, and a big welcome to you all. I'm not seeing any LinkedIn comments come through to the platform that we stream in. Um, sometimes this happens. Um, so look, bear with us, but do maybe send a few comments in there from LinkedIn. We do see them coming in from YouTube. That's great, and it's great to see people join us from Brazil, etc. But if you're on LinkedIn, please comment. We'll try and fix the issue so that I can see them. But currently, I don't see your comments at all. But keep, please keep commenting because we will solve it during the course of this live stream here. And then we'll be able to hopefully answer your questions live. So just because I, I may be not seeing them, keep commenting as we go through our demo today. Um, and hopefully, we'll get it fixed throughout the duration of this live stream. It's happened before. LinkedIn gets a bit messy with us sometimes, but we've been here before, but we'll continue on nonetheless. So today, I said in the intro, you know, we're looking at kind of a few different technologies, Google's Gemma, um, we're lo looking at some of the LLMs from Hugging Face, et cetera, as well, too. Can we start a little bit, I suppose, from the point of view of RAG, as I said at the introduction, Retrieval Augmented Generation? What does that mean for those that might be joining us who don't know much about that or why you would use it? Um, could you give us a kind of a, a 30,000 foot level view of, of what that might mean? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we all know this AI, uh, this AI models uh, foundation or base models are very intelligent, such as uh, models such as GPT-4 or Gemma. They've been trained on large corpus of text of the internet. Um, but when using them in application, in real application, we actually need relevant and up-to-date data. And one way to what I what I will call ground this AI models into relevant data is using RAG, retrieval augmented generation, which simply means you're giving you're, you're giving the model more relevant knowledge, more non-parametric knowledge. So we look at the knowledge, the knowledge of the model as parametric knowledge, and mm -hmm. now you're 
adding the non-parametric knowledge to that overall architecture to essentially give your users or yourself that relevant information, up-to-date information, and essentially reduce what you can call as hallucination. You want the, the real factual data of wherever you're searching up. So that's retrieval augmented generation, taking a user query and just adding more relevant context and passing that in, passing that into the into the large language model. Of course, there are in between um, in between components that we're going to discuss, such as the embedding model and vector search, which we're going to discuss in this demo. But that's mm -hmm. the high level overview of it. We're just trying to ground this LLM in reality. Excellent. Yeah, because I mean, there was a period of time where they were, you know, a little bit lagging in terms of training. Obviously, now some of them more recently have caught up, become more up to date, etc. As well, too. But this is also very key for. I suppose, uh, specific knowledge. So within inside a company, within inside a, a field of, say, medicine, et cetera, as well, RAG is hugely used because these large language models are trained on general knowledge, general corpus of information, broad-based global knowledge. And you might want to leverage that plus the specifics of maybe your industry, right? Yeah. And you're very spot on. And one thing with the alternative is you fine tune the model on the data you have, right? And mm -hmm. that can be very expensive and costly for some people. So RAG is seen as an alternative to fine tuning and also in some cases using conjunction with fine tuning for that increased um, accuracy of response. But it is very, it's the reason why it's very popular is because it's it's very cost effective, easy to implement. Uh, within any architecture or any sort of application from POCs to full production applications. So um, we, we can we can definitely, I'm going to definitely show how easy it is to get started with RAG. Excellent. And tell me then, bringing us right up to date into Google's Gemma, why, you know, what was the inception of that? Why did Google put out another model? Um, what's the use case for that? Um, and it's an open model. So how does that benefit most? So honestly, I would love to know why Google put out another model, but I'm not. I'm not inside of Google. What I can say is what they tell us essentially. But um, and I can make some speculations. But uh, in AI, it, it is best not to speculate. But if you can, if you can share my screen, I can. I can show you a, a short presentation. So to talk about Gemma, we have to first talk about Gemini, which is the state of the art um, uh, model, uh, multimodal model released by Google. And the reason why they, they put out Gemini is obviously the, the space of AI has shifted to the to the um, to the sort of the direction of foundation model and creating this huge AI models that know a lot about our world. And you can you can basically send in a prompt, either image, mm -hmm. text, and get something out. But this is closed, right? This is a closed uh, model. We don't know what it's been trained on. We don't know the we don't know the data it's been trained on. We don't know the internal architecture and components of Gemini. But rest assured, Google told us that Gemma was built with the same building blocks and component and the same research team as Gemini. So okay. we are tapping into that closed um, closed source models power, and and Google has given us Gemma, but. They've not only given us one model, Gemma is, Gemma is a family of models, specifically two. So we have a model variant with 2 billion parameters and another one that is much bigger with 7 billion parameters. And you mentioned that they are open model. And one thing you'll notice within the space of AI is there is this um, clash, um, closed source versus open source. Um, open model is sort of on the, on the spectrum leaning towards open source. It's not open source. Mm -hmm. Open model is Google's way of um, sort of retaining some sort of retaining some usability of their models. They you have to agree to some terms of use of the model before you can use them. But you do have access to the the weights of the model and understand how it was trained and and other details of the model that is not necessarily disclosed by the likes of others like OpenAI or GPT or the GPT variants. But um that is Gemma two variants, two, we have the two billion parameter, seven billion parameter, and it's an open model. And, and what, what would be the difference for between the two billion and the seven, the, the five, leaving the five billion aside in terms of, it, is it more accurate? Does it have a larger corpus? Does, you know, why would you choose one or over the other? Yeah, so essentially the way an AI model 
it is essentially learns is it tunes what we have inside the model that are called weights. And these are parameters that take on different numerical value that reflect mm -hmm. the patterns within the training data they've been fed with. So as you can imagine, more weights, you can think about this weights as neurons in your brain. So more weights mean you have more capacity to learn different relationship between the training data you're fed with. So you can then make the assumption that a 7 billion model will in some cases have more ability to that to show more intelligence in mm -hmm. loosely speaking um is it more accurate well that is you have to do some tests but generally speaking it tends to be yes okay. it does um mm -hmm. so that, that i hope that's a very good explanation um i hope that answers your your question <laughs> no it, it certainly does and i i think We've done these before and we get questions in going, you know, what do they mean by large language models? Can I do my own? And, and you know, the seven billion parameters, off you go if you really want to try and do that without, you know, a ton of money and a ton of compute behind it, by all means do. But these models are enormous. And I think that clearly illustrates that. Yeah, 100 percent. And what Google have done is they've given us a base model, which um, folks can actually fine tune with their own data, but have also given us the instruct model. So this will basically, this is a model that has been fine tuned by Google on to, to basically act, act like a chatbot, essentially. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're gonna be using the instruct model today because it, it fits within the RAG um, architecture and use cases people are, are, are based, the, the, the use case and the general form factor of AI today is chat interfaces. So it makes sense to use the instruct model because we're not gonna be doing any fine tuning today. And all of this is made available through Hugging Face, which, which essentially, um, for those who don't know, Hugging Face enable you, enables you to access the three main commodities within, within AI, which is mm -hmm. compute, um, data, and models. So uh, all of them live on the Hugging Face, the one that are open models are open sourced anyway, and you can access all of these um, commodities to essentially build your AI application. Um, and fun fact, we have um, uh, a hackathon in New York happening on April 6th, sponsored by Hugging Face. So do check that out, guys. Yeah, I think, and I'll, I'll dig out a link. I know we have a link there somewhere for that as well, too. And I'll put that up dur during the stream. The one thing, too, before we dive into it, you did this, you know, you wrote the article that we have up on our MongoDB Developer Center within about two days of, of Google's announcement of, of Gemma. So you dive straight in there, Richmond, to, to test it out. How was everything from that point of view? Did they have the documentation up to date? Did everything come together? Was it easy or, you know, as a super early adopter, you know, did you struggle a little bit or was, was it okay? So it was very, again, Hugging Face makes all of these models and all of these assets uh, very easily available to developers. Is why they're loved by the AI community. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing to note, the only, hic the only hiccup that I came across when trying to use this model was upgrading um, the, the package, the transformer package I, was, okay. I had on my machine. And that was the only hiccup. Apart from that, very easy as I'll show you how how you can leverage this um, this model that essentially is one of one one of the best performing open models out there. Um, but very straightforward, I guess that's why it's two days, right? The the architecture of RAG is is re is replicable across different models, and with mm -hmm. Hugging it almost makes it a plug and play. Okay. Uh, plug and play kind of situation. Uh, so yeah, so that's why that's why it was very quick for me to put uh, content out and talk about this. And it's exciting, it's exciting. Yeah, yeah, no fair play. I appreciate the speed at which you got to that. So before we get into the demo, I wanted to just ask again on LinkedIn, because I, I see 290 plus live viewers on LinkedIn, no comments yet. I did see one comment get through. So our connection here in the system we use to look at comments across LinkedIn and YouTube seems to be okay. There just may be no comments yet. Always when we get into demos, Richmond, people start to ask particular questions. So I would say to the viewers, if you have any questions, please put them through LinkedIn there for us, put them in YouTube. If you're having any issues on LinkedIn, we're streaming on YouTube concurrently. So you could jump across to MongoDB's YouTube channel and do your comments there. If I'm not seeing them come through, we will endeavor to make sure that if they do come through, if it's pertaining to what Richmond's going through at the time, well, 
I'll interrupt him. We'll bring it on screen and we'll discuss that. And if not, we'll get towards him at the end. But just in case there's any break in our connection, please keep your LinkedIn comments coming and we'll keep an eye on those coming through. But so, um, yeah, and it's good to see those that have joined us so so far as well. So it, that, that's great. Great to have such good numbers. Um, so, Richmond, we're going to build this RAG system, right? We're going to, do you want to put a timer on yourself? How long is this going to take us? Well, because I'm going to be doing a lot of explaining, it's not going to be a true reflection of the time of implementation. And really, any developer would know, like, you're probably going to have to debug certain things and uh, related to the specific data you're using. So this is not the Olympics, but I will get you started very quickly. And all the code and assets that we share on, on in MongoDB in AI is available in this uh, repository over here. So I'm sure, Shane, you provide them a link of this and you can access multiple notebooks covering not just the specific uh, Gemma, but also we cover Cloud by Anthropic that was released a few weeks ago as well. Some of the new embedded models from OpenAI um, that happened uh, last month in February as well are here and just helping you developers get to success. Perfect. Well, look, I just put those links out. They seem to have gone out okay on YouTube and LinkedIn. So hopefully people can jump into that repo and have a, have a a look around. Logan, you said as a video later on YouTube after the stream, yes, you missed the introduction. It's always available. All of this show and indeed everything else we do on MongoDB TV is on our LinkedIn and YouTube channels all the time. So LinkedIn, it'll be in past events. YouTube, it'll be in our live uh, playlist there and our live stream there. You can see the past events as well too. And also keep an eye on what's coming from myself and my other colleagues who stream regularly here on MongoDB TV. So Richmond, I am interrupting you getting started. Off you go. Tell us tell us what we're going to be doing. Okay. So I'm going to go through this notebook step by step. I will explain some of the some of the activities that I'm doing. Um, building a RAG pipeline, you have very typical stages. You mm -hmm. go from your data loaded, your data loading to ingestion to actually building out the vector search um, um, code to then doing handling the user query. So those are the typical pipeline stages, and I'm just gonna which will be reflected in the code here. So the first step is always to I'm using a Google Colab environment, by the way, um, mm -hmm. and I have the compute which is an A100 with which provides me with GPU access. And in the spirit of openness, um, all the models we're using here is hosted on Hogging Face, including the embedding models and Gemma, the Gemma model itself. So um, we can get started with the first cell. So um, you get started by installing a few libraries. So we have the data sets library. This library essentially gives us access to all the data set commodities that I spoke about on Hogging Face. We have pandas, which essentially allows us to provide us with data structures that allows um, very good um, data analysis and data restructuring and modification. Then PyMongo actually provides us with that uh, access to a few operators methods that allows us to access our mm -hmm. database, our MongoDB database and perform any database and collection operations. Then lastly, we have the sentence transformers, which gives us access to the embedded model that we're gonna be using within within this uh, notebook. And I'm also, we also have the Transformers um, uh, library from Hugging Face as well. And Accelerate will basically tune our development environment and the libraries to be able to use the GPU that we have within the environment. And you only need to install this if you're using the GPU. Okay. So first stage, we're gonna load our data. Um, from the data set library, we're gonna import the load data set um, method. And mm -hmm. what we have to do here is just with the load data set, we're just passing the path to the embedded movies data set. Now, this data set was created um, by the MongoDB team and with embeddings as well. So the embeddings in this data set are made using the Adar 03 from OpenAI uh, with, a 100, with 1,536 um, dimension. And you can access this date, the full data set through this link. But one thing we're going to be doing is re-embedding the fields here for this demo because OpenAI's embedding models are not open source, but we want to use open source only models within this demo. So we're going to load our data set into this variable um, data set. And then and just get... before we move on, I mean, we touched on it at the beginning, Richmond. And for those that aren't familiar, because we keep coming across this at 
hackathons and events that we're doing. Back in June of last year, MongoDB launched Vector Search, Atlas yeah. Vector Search. And for us, it was a game changer. Number one, it allowed us to participate in this AI revolution because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's driven by data. And so many customers, so many users, so many developers have their data already on MongoDB. And they were using third party um, you know, vector databases to, in order to enable them to build generative AI applications. With the launch of MongoDB Vector Search back in June, that didn't need to happen anymore. We store the vectors associated with your data alongside your data. So you're not doing any round trips. You're essentially the motto that all of us in the DevRel team learn quite early, which is data that is accessed together should be stored together is wholly true even for your vectors now. So the one thing that we'd like to point out to everybody is Atlas, well-known database as a service in the cloud since about 2017, and MongoDB goes back all the way to about 2007. But since last year, we've been a vector database as well too. So we're a vector data store. You no longer need to lift and shift your data out of Atlas to go and, and do anything in the generative AI space. Just simply create a vector search index, run that data through some embeddings and away you go. So in this instance, what uh, Richmond pointed out there is we've taken our standard data sets that we always use in our demos and, and our training and our models, and we've actually done some embeddings in them. But as Richmond said, we're not going to use what we did there, but we're going to re-embed it. But for those that want to get started in generative AI, all of our demos, you're not going off and having to go and redo the embeddings in most of the ones that we put out there as samples because we've already done that for you. So it's super quick to get up and, and running. So uh, sorry for the long interrupt, Richmond, but I just wanted to get that out there. Get that plug in or I'm not doing my day job, you know? <laughs> and it's much needed because one thing we, we should be pointing out is in MongoDB, we we'll realize that there is there is a very great importance in providing the community, the AI community with the assets and commodities that allows them to build AI application. And embedded data is just one of it, right? So mm -hmm. if you go to the MongoDB organization on the hugging face, you're gonna see more data set, not just the embedded movies data set, but other data set we've been uploading for the past few months, just to get you guys working with different type of data um, and essentially building POCs that reflect what you can expect in production. I think the 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 the, the highest data set, the data points we have is uh, one of our data set has over a million records. And so you get that true volume of a production like system. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, can, can we get, can we move on? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Work away. Work away. <laughs> I, uh, so we, what, what we then do is uh, we've basically loaded our data set into this variable called data set, rightfully so. Um, but we're converting it to a data frame, which allows for one visualization and also modification. And just to see what the data set looks like, um, I'm just gonna, we have on screen here, the attributes and the first five data points. So the embedded movie data set contains information of different, different sort of movies and also attributes such as the genre, title, the full plot, the directors and other information. But one thing you're gonna notice is we have the embeddings of each of these movies and this embedding was created by um, by running the full plot through the the OpenAI model to generate a numerical representation of the data, which captures the semantics, and this is what this essentially is going to plug into to what vector search is about. But like I said, we're going to be removing this embedding and replacing it with one that was generated using an open source embedding model. Um, do you have any questions, Shane? No, but John asks just there, you picked up on you mentioning the 1 million size data set that we have embeddings for. Which one was that, you know, Richmond offhand? Well, it's called a tech news data set and it was released by Hacker Noon. And Hacker Noon had the original data set was about 6 million data points. And what we did over here at MongoDB is we took a subset of that and mm -hmm. embedded. Um, a field to allow people to allow developers to essentially start conducting vector search without having to go through the process of embedding, which which okay. is very long. I can tell you that I did it myself. It was a very long process. Um, so that's yeah. the Hack Noon data set, then. So, 
So it's a it's it's a subset, it's a variant of the Hacker Noon data set. If you go to the MongoDB um, organization, you'll be able to see the tech news embedded data set. Perfect. Thank you for that. Okay, so um I think this is yeah, we left off at talking about the 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 data points and the attributes of this data set. And the next step is we go through this data preparation stage. Uh, one thing we have to do is clean the data, essentially drop any any null value specifically in the full plot attribute, because that is what we're going to be using to conduct our new embedding. And then we have a, uh, we, have, we look at the stats to see if there's any, any other missing data points. One thing as well also that I'm doing is I'm dropping the plot embedding column, which is going to remove all the plot embedding attributes from each data point because we're going to be creating the new embedding. Um, and for sanity check, we just look at what the first five looks like, the first five data points, and we can see that there isn't any of our um, plot, uh, plot embedding or any embedding da data points for each of these uh, data points. There isn't any plot embedding attributes for each of these data points because we've removed them. Excellent. So, Excellent. And, and John did my job for me. He went off and he found a link to, to the tech news embedding. So I appreciate that, John. Thank you. <laughs> I was Googling myself at the time or searching, but uh, you got there before me. Well done. <laughs> um, so next is uh, I was talking about the fact we're going to be using a open source embedding model to embed the, the full plot attribute that we're going to use for our vector search. So this essentially, this embedded model can be obtained from Hogging Face. It's a GTE large model and embedded model. And it essentially was created by research scientists at Alibaba, I believe. And um, it, it embeds uh, data with the dimension of 1024, I believe. Yeah. And we're going to be using this model and putting using it to embed the full plot um, attribute for each of the data points we have. And okay. very simple. Richmond, can I, one of the questions that comes up when we do this a lot is the choice of embedding model. How do you choose or why did you choose the GTE large in this instance? And because there's lots of embedding models out there that are more suitable to specific data sets, et cetera, than others. Um, was there any reason behind the GTE large or just the simplicity getting started with the well-known embedding? Yeah, model? it was GTE large is very, very quite popular within the field. It's a very popular open source model. Mm -hmm. And if you do want to want to select one in terms of accuracy, there's a benchmark um, board on Hogging Phase that actually lists all the embedding models and their performance and different um, evaluative metrics. So GT okay. Large is amongst the top 10 or top 20. I'm not too sure where it ranks on. And it's better, it performs better than, uh, uh, I think, the ADA or O2. I think it performs mm -hmm. better than that. Okay. And there's also variants of the GT Large as well. There's a there's a small variant of the, so you could just uh, change this to GTE small, but I'm not too sure what the dimensions of that of the embeddings from that model is, but it's a smaller one that will fit on your local device if you even okay. don't have if you're constrained with the with uh, storage requirements and so storage uh, requirements on your device. Excellent, thank you. That's very clear. Thank you. Um, so getting on with the embedding, we're going to define a function called get embedding, and we're we're going to do a, uh, just a check to make sure that we don't have any empty strings from the full plot, but we shouldn't because we we removed any null values or any empty values earlier on in the data cleaning process. And using embedding your data, a data point is very simple, um, especially with Hugging Face. You just get the embedding, the embedding model and call the dot encode uh, method and pass in the data point, um, data, the data point or the data that you actually want to embed. And this is will be the full plot text uh, from each of the data points we're going to pass into this function. And then we return the embedding uh, return from the model. And then we do a conversion to, uh, to a Python list because this is actually returned as a NumPy array. So we just do a conversion here to a Python list. And that is the definition of the get embed, get embedding function. And to use it, what we're going to do is within, that, within our data set, more specifically the data frame um, version of our data set, 
we're going to add a new column for every attribute called embedding. And we're going to just use the function that we defined our pair to essentially go through each of the data point and execute this function using the full plot text. So we're going to take the full plot text, mm -hmm. uh, the full plot data point, and pass it into this function as a text to be embedded, which would then pass it into the embedding model, which would then return the numerical representation of, of this uh, full plot that captures the semantics. So that was a mouthful, but that's the process. <laughs> what we now have is, again, for sanity check, we can just look at the first five data points. And what we now have is a new field called embedding that I'm has numerical embeddings that of, of the full plot text. But now this is an embedding created using an open source model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, next, we can go on with the with the exciting part, which is connecting to MongoDB. So one thing we can this is pretty trivial for most if, if most people are, are using MongoDB. But what we're doing right here is establishing a connection to our database and getting a, an, an object of that database and also the collection within a database. So within within this uh, within this notebook, I've created a database called Movies. I've also created a collection called Movie Collection 2. And what PyMongo allows me to do is actually have objects that allows me to access those collection and also perform several operations as I'm going to show you here. And the next cell goes into cleaning up my, my collection. So I've done this demo several times, but <laughs> I'm doing a bunch, I'm doing a batch clean here. And that just cleans out the collection, which is the movies collection too. And that cleans it out just to empty it out as we can see the result here with deleted 1,452 data points or records. Then we go into the next stage, which is that data ingestion stage. This is when we're moving our data that we've just created with the embedding field into the MongoDB um, database and more specifically the collection, the movie collection to uh, collection. So we're going to convert our we're going to convert our data sets and each data point into dictionaries. And this will allow us to use the batch, um, the batch ingestion operation from PyMongo with mm -hmm. the function called insert many. And you can just pass in the documents just at once. So data ingestion in two lines of code, very simple with PyMongo. And once it's completed, you can check your, your MongoDB um, collection and database on MongoDB Atlas to just see if 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 it's been ingested properly. Um, one thing to mention is you do need to create a vector search index on MongoDB, which allows you to define the 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 field you want to be able to you want to be using to conduct your vector search um, similarity and to conduct mm -hmm. vector search with. So in this case, our vector search index has the embedding field to be able to conduct the 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 query um, vector search with essentially. Next, we'll be moving into creating that vector search function. So I'm going to go through this step by step. But essentially, we're creating a vector search function. And what this function does is going to take a user query, which is going to be a string, mm -hmm. and it's going to take the collection object, which is going to contain all the records with the field that we have the embeddings for each of the, for that has embeddings for each of the records. So we have to convert the user query from text into an embedding with the same embedding model we used to embed the full plot of all the movies. And we have to make sure we're doing this so we use them with the same function, get embedding. And we pass in the, the, the user query and we get a numerical representation of the user query, which is the embedding. And we do some check here just to make sure we have the right, with the, the right data. And then what we can do, especially with MongoDB, is start to build stages and which creates this composable composable pipeline, this composable query pipeline, where you can add different stage to conduct different different type of search, different type of search and operation. So the first stage we're going to be adding is the vector search stage, right? And this conducts the actual vector search, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. references our vector index by the name we've given it, and takes in as the query vector the the text the user query and the numerical embedding of it um the numerical representation of it as the query which is the query embedding we also specify the path 
that the embedding to that the that the that the path that the records um the embedding field of the record has in the query as well the number of candidate we want to consider for the vector search and the amount of records we want to return so we're only going to be returning the top four records okay. that was a mouthful but yeah. This no, is super, super clear. And you, you touched on probably the second most asked question whenever we do these Gen AI is, is your query have to go through the same embeddings as your data was? And the answer is always yes. You can't query cross embeddings, or at least not yet anyway. I don't know anyone who's figured that one out. There must be some product there somewhere that's the universal translator for embeddings yeah. somewhere somehow. Yeah. But that's the that's the key thing that comes up all the time is that it's super important. The same model, the same model for your data, the same model for your query. And one thing you have to realize is MongoDB is a, is a robust solution for for AI application, including ones that including ones that look, people that are looking for vector databases. Because if we were to make that mistake of mm. specifying the the dimensions of embeddings on your vector or in your vector index and use a different dimension so if this query embedding was used using um open ai it would have a dimension of 1536 mongodb will actually throw an error to just say hey there is a mismatch here mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that will essentially allow you to avoid any problems very early on so we've created a just on the, the the number of candidates as 150 was that arbitrary from your point of view making it just quicker to get through um, I understand limiting the results to four, but the number yeah. of candidates? So that's the number of candidates you're essentially considering for your vector search. And it was an arbitrary number, right? So okay. I can't make this number any higher than my than the actual number of records I have. So I couldn't make this number, I couldn't make it 2,000 because I, I don't have 2,000 mm. doctors to consider as candidates. Um, okay. An okay. arbitrary number, but typically you want to be uh, limiting the number. Um, you want to be using this number keeping it as small as possible, but not too small to essentially yes. improve the accuracy. But the bigger the number you 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 use, the more increase in latency in terms of the search. But, okay, understood. So you're, you've taken kind of, say, by 10% of the records that you exactly. have there. Okay. Back to okay. 10 is a, good, is a good measure. So and I'm only, I only need four, essentially, um, because at the end of the day, I, I'm building a recommender system, a movie recommender system, and I just need one movie recommended. So definitely when you're modeling your 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 documents in, in MongoDB, you should be thinking of what the end result is to be for, for yes. the actual application you're building. Um another stage I'm adding here, and this is important for some people, is I'm using an onset stage to remove the embedding from the results that are going to be returned. And the reason is to just um I'm not going to be using the embeddings uh, anymore. Uh, this is the numerical representation, and they tend to be quite large. So mm -hmm. removing it reduces some of the operation that the database server has to do, and which could reduce the query execution time. So I'm removing the embedding. I don't need it. I don't need it in further down processes. There might be situations. Always a good rule to to do that, and unless you live in the matrix and you can read <laughs> vectors, there's no point seeing them, right? There is no point, but there might be some situation. Um, there, there might be some situations where you might want to keep the embedding and use it in further downstream processes. Okay. There might be scenarios such as that um, where you might actually want to do that. Um, I haven't encountered one, but I'm sure. I'm sure there are. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm sure there are. So, if we look and the next stage, I'm actually putting through is is um the projection state right using a project operator to include some of the fields that i want in the in the result so i want the full plot i want the title and i want the genre of the movie and this helps the the language model this data points we help the language model make a selection essentially mm -hmm. it gives them that additional context i'm also adding a vector search score just for monitoring purposes i don't necessarily necessarily need it mm -hmm. but mm -hmm we're leaving the model to choose which one of the options we give it is the best recommended movie. So, but if we weren't, we could have selected the, the movie that is returned from the result, the one with the highest score, or you could have just limited this to one essentially. Mm -hmm. But we want that variation on what the model to choose from the, the, the information we're providing it. And next, what we're going to do is just build that 
aggregation pipeline right here. So we're going to start with the vector search. Then we're going to remove the embedding. Then we're going to include the fields we want. And this is this is very this is a very easy to understand composable query pipeline. Just the different stages that are involved in in your in your vector search pipeline. And then we pass that into the aggregate method of the collection, which executes the mm -hmm. the each of the stages sequentially. And we return, we get a list. What what is returned is a list, and we're going to see this in action very soon. But we have to define another function, which is called get search result. Now, the purpose of this function is just formatting. Um, what what I want to do is just format the information returned mm -hmm. from the the information retrieval process in a way that the LLM could understand it better. Um, it's not that necessary to do, but this is just me. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then next, so in, in order for this to work, we have to actually get the information from the database. So we call a variable, we define a variable called get knowledge, and we call that vector search um, function with the we defined earlier here, passing the query and the collection object, and we, we get all the search results, we all the information we need, which is four records that allows us to um, uh, uh, conduct, give more additional context to our large language model, to Gemma. So, we format it over here, just looping through each of the record and just using this format. And quick tip, you can use a, a, a library like Pydantic to mm -hmm. ensure that these are follow the, the right structure, um, the right structure that you're expecting from the, from the database. Um, this is just good for data validation and it just has that bit of robustness and security to your, mm -hmm. um, to your AI applications. Um, and that is the get search results. So we have a function that does the vector search and we have a function that does that actually uses the vector search to get the results and formats it. And we've called it get search results. So Excellent. now it's, now it's time to actually, do, do you have a question, Shane? Just before we show it, John had one quick question on the in the score. Um, was it based on index similarity? Um, how does it work? Yeah, so that is a very good question. So when when we're when you're going to be defining your vector search index among the DB Atlas, you'll be specifying what um, similarity function you want to use. So the common are cosine, dot product, and equilibrium, and those are essentially distance measure. So within a vector space, you have several embeddings. And uh, a vector space is a hyperdimensional space with several several embeddings which are numerical representation. And for you to detect which ones are quite similar, you just compute the distance between one embedding and the other. So the closer an embedding is to another, the more semantically um, similar they are. That's the assumption. And, and you can use different distance uh diff distance different diff different function to measure these distance so i'm using cosine but you can experiment with what actually works best for your particular use case yeah well explained i think that's one of the conceptual things that people struggle with is you know <laughs> three dimensions fine four dimensions fine you know a thousand <laughs> and whatever dimensions or 1500 dimensions my head explodes you know yeah, so you I think you did a really good job in explaining, you know, how that applies to vectors. Was it the hand movements? <laughs> <laughs> always, always. I'm a big fan of the hand movements for explaining complex problems. <laughs> well, so now we're going to move on to the query. So I'm just going to define a query here. What is the best romantic movie to watch and why? It's going to be the question we're going to be asking Gemma. And we're going to give Gemma a bunch of movies to actually select using that get search result function. Mm -hmm because we want to ground Gemma in factual, relevant information. Then I just have a simple um, a simple string that has the query, and I instruct Gemma to continue to answer the query using the search results, which then has the search results. And this is the combined information, essentially. Combined context would have been a better variable name, but combined information will do. And this is what it looks like. We have the query, we have the instruction for Gemma, and we have the search results that we've provided Gemma. And we get to the part, I guess, we've all been waiting for, which is how do you get Gemma into your mm. development environment? And with Hugging Face, it's very simple. 
you just using the transformer library. It's very simple using the transformer library, just using the auto tokenizer and also the 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 auto model for Kozier LM LLM for Kozier LM libraries um, to actually access the models by by the path. Just as simple as what we did with our data set. And all of this have the, the pages on Hogging Face so you can see more information about the models in terms mm -hmm. of how to use it through other different methods. And with Hogging Face, you can probably create an inference endpoint. So you'd have to worry about um, nuances such as this. But one thing I do want to point out is if you're using a GPU model, um, you do have to, one, use the Accelerate, Accelerate library from Hogging Face and mm -hmm. specify the device map and put the auto parameter um when you're actually getting uh getting a model so but if you're not you can just uncomment this in the notebook and you should be good to go but i'm using the gpu kind of speeds things up relatively quickly but mm -hmm. remember these gemma models are quite small in comparison to other models out there two billion parameter should be enough to fit on most machines um again grok came out uh and it was about 340 something billion it was pounds. big yeah <laughs> it was big we i don't but um we wouldn't be able to host that on on my machine it would explode but um so that's how you just get Gemma. very simple mm -hmm. quick and we're using the instruction tuned version of it and next thing is we're actually going to again i'm using the gpu we get our tokenizer which takes in the 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 query mm -hmm. that concatenated with the search results and we're going to specify the CUDA the dot two CUDA here because we're using a GPU and then we simply just call the model we mm -hmm. just call the model and we call the generate um we call the generate method on the model we pass it the input which is essentially the tokenized version of our query and then we specify the, the max token. I'm specifying, you don't have to do this, but I'm specifying the max token um, for the model to give back. And I think this maxes out at 500, not too sure, don't quote me on that. But this essentially holds our response to the question, what is the best romantic movie to watch? Mm -hmm. Gemma actually produces this, sends us this back, which is a question that mm -hmm. we've asked it, and also a final answer, which is, Based on the search result, the best romantic movie to watch is Shut Up and Kiss Me. I have never watched that movie before. Have you, Shane? Definitely not. Definitely not. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about number three there, Titanic. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's not a, not a romantic movie. She didn't let him onto the little door that she was floating on and survive. You know, <laughs> it's a very tough romantic movie. <laughs> I don't know how we classify romantic movies, and uh, but I will go. I will go. With, I will go with Gemma on this one. Yeah, at least yeah. It, it didn't recommend Titanic. So, um, but yeah, so that's how easy it is to get started with Gemma. A very small model in comparison to, to to the likes, and you can host it on a Google Collab or even on your local machine because it can run on CPU as CPU devices as well. Um, and Gemma gave us a reason, right? It says, because it is a romantic comedy that explores the complexities of love and relationship. What do I know about romance? Gemma knows more than me, apparently. Um, and that's how you build a movie recommendation system that uses that rug architectural um, pipeline that we've, we've heard of using open source or open models. Mm. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And and I think the key thing, again, from probably when we do say these kind of semantic searches using AI as well, too, is, is kind of the underpinning, you know, what's a semantic search? It's not a straightforward search as we're used to doing for all of the last 20 odd years. Semantic search is fully about finding, you know, not the same keyword in, as you say, the plot that you're looking up here or the, the synopsis of the movie. The semant is finding the meaning within that. So as you said there, Richmond, you know, you only ask for the best romantic movie. I don't think even in the text, okay, romance appears in the plot text, but it doesn't say romantic. So it's not trying to find, you know, plots with right. the word romantic in it. It's finding the sentiment. It knows about it. And I think that's really, for me, I suppose, the you know, and especially from coming from a MongoDB perspective where all our, you know, it's all data, 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 you know, to 
extract meaning from data is incredibly powerful. So regardless of what data sets you have, regardless of what data you're using, being able to run some of these embeddings extracts the meaning and uh, out of those embeddings as well too. And, and as you quite clearly illustrated well, is then you can see, you know, which are the adjacent ones with inside your vectors as well too, which yeah. becomes incredibly powerful. And, and the use cases of, of vector embeddings really spans beyond just conducting semantic search or, or vector or, or, mm. or, or, or recommendation system. I remember when I was a computer vision engineer, we used to use vector embeddings to match poses, right? So mm. we used to, if I did a pose like waving my hands, we used to use um, cosine similarity and we, we plotted all the pose estimation information in a vector. And we did a, a, a simple... Um, uh, cosine distance measure of all of these different poses to get to get similar poses together. So it, it really is a concept that if you understand it, it spans different domains across AI from natural language to computer vision, even convolutional neural networks, they see stuff in, in vectors, right? So understanding that concept really goes a long way. Yeah. And I think, look, it's, as we said at the intro, as I said at the beginning, the speed of which this seems to have become out into the fore, the speed at which companies are producing, you know, large language models and, you know, tools and embeddings, et cetera, et cetera, as well, too, is, is catching people by surprise, I suppose. As a practitioner, Richmond, how do you keep up to date with everything that's changing in this space from a from a, a day to day, if not even, you know, it's it's it, or an hour to hour basis, it would seem on some days, right? So the, I would love to say I keep up, but the truth is I can't I, and I don't, right? So there's a lot happening in AI, and anyone says that that they're experts or they're keeping up is is lying or trying to sell you something. But um, <laughs> it's impossible to keep up, honestly. There's there's stuff happening in computer vision. There's stuff happening in robotics. There's stuff happening in in natural language. There's stuff ha happening on the tooling side, and it, it's it's exciting. That's what I can say. And if you want a field where you could just constantly learn and never get bored, this is the right place to be. Every day is a new challenge. It's exciting, and you don't know when OpenAI might decide to just 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 turn your whole day upside down and release a new model. And yeah. it, one thing I also do is I try to build um, tools like this. I try to use the models as soon as they come out to understand what their limitations are. I do a lot of reading and I build a lot of real applications that people use in production. So um, being an engineer, being a developer is the best way to learn and keep up with this. Yeah, I, I think so. And And one of the things too is, as you said at the beginning, this field is relatively new for most. There, and as you just said, there's no experts. It's so hard to keep up with what's going on. And I think that gives a huge opportunity to developers looking to jump into this space yeah. because you're not too far behind the curve. The, you know, the, the, the puck, as that hockey kind of notation goes, you know, you, you go to where the puck is going, not where it is. That's important. You've got to follow and, and get your hands dirty try the demos, get on board, create some concepts, you know, make and break things and see how you get on with it, right? And it's easier than ever. You don't have to be like me and spend several thousand pounds and go go do a master's and buy a huge textbook. <laughs> Just watch a, a tutorial like this or watch a YouTube video. Yeah, and where's that huge textbook now, Richmond? Is it holding up your monitor, is it? No, I, <laughs> it's gathering dust somewhere. I didn't make it past the first chapter. <laughs> <laughs> very good very good we did get a question in from our pal john hopefully it'll fit and hopefully be able to read it and i think this is um, i've seen this come up before too is um about the confusion between using something like langchain or llama index where you don't have to convert the question into embeddings and that still does a direct embedding search how does that work and and yeah so just to quickly explain, we love the team of our Langchain and Llama Index. We work with them very closely. We actually have a Langchain and MongoDB integration that came out yesterday, um, which allows you to implement a memory and semantic cache and take your RAG system to the next level. But to answer that question straight away is Llama Index and Langchain are doing embeddings behind the scene. So mm -hmm. they're not exposing that to you. But if you go within the Langchain and Llama Index documentation, you can actually control 
um, the fields that does the embeddings um, in Llama Index, it's they use nodes um, to actually conduct the embeddings. And I have, uh, I think um, one of the tutorials on on MongoDB Dev Center actually shows you how to manipulate the embeddings as well. But long story short, they, they have default embedding uh, models set, which is typically OpenAI. It's why they usually ask you for your OpenAI key when you're using the libraries. Um, and that's what's happening in the background. But you go deeper into the libraries, you can actually change the embedding models and change what fields the embedding models are based on as well. Okay. So in this instance, in your example, obviously, you're explicitly setting it, whereas using either of those platforms, they're yeah. doing it behind the scenes for you. But yeah. as you say, you can go in and fine tune and adjust that as, as you exactly. want as well, too. The tools such as um, Langchain and, and, and Llama Index, what they are is um, they're essentially abstraction layer because sometimes you just want to see if something works and mm -hmm. get production as quickly as you can. So they take away all, all of the thinking and fine tuning away from you. They tell you what's happening if you go into the documentation and you can not you can change it, but they, they are a layer of abstraction. Sometimes you need them, sometimes you don't. But um, for developers that want to move very quickly, they do use tools like that. Yeah, so that goes back to your point about just getting started and playing around with things. That's an easy avenue to go in and just you leverage kind of their their platforms to, you know, get your toes wet, as it were, in this space. Yeah, um, and they're, they're building an ecosystem essentially that spans just outside of the library. There's the observability angle that Llama Index and and um, Langchain are taking with Lang Smith, and Llama Index is really doubling down on actually helping people work with unstructured data and passing that through through their through their um systems as well so it, it's it's really again like i said the space of ai is so broad there's so many places you can point your attention to so there's exciting things happening all around excellent and i suppose just finishing up now and a couple more kind of forward thinking questions maybe is it's kind of what you mentioned, you know, we're using Gemma, it's an open source model or an open model and not necessarily open source model. What do you see as the future of those type of open models versus the closed models, et cetera, in the evolving kind of space of AI? Yeah, it's a, that's an interesting question because um, it's pretty much the, the debate that is going on, but mm. very quickly um, this summer, We'll probably see um, Llama 3 get released, which is an open source model from from which is going to be an open source model from Meta. Um, but in terms of the where do we see it going? I see closed source mod, um, open source model catching up to the performance of closed source models. Mm -hmm. um, there is a quite popular um, graph, and again, I think you can find the metrics on I think papers with code that shows you the performance of different models on something called uh, um, the massive multi multitask language understanding. I, I've got the, I've got the benchmark here. It's okay. a multitask language understanding. And this is a benchmark that tests models on different reasoning tasks, different cognition tasks that spans various subjects like AI, maths, psychology, and they're just testing the models on, on the ability mm -hmm. to answer these questions and open source are not too far off from the performance of closed source even though closed source models are very performant open source are not too far off and we can see that gap closing Excellent. except except it's something crazy comes out in the next few months from from open ai or google maybe they're working on something behind the scenes that that blows everything out of the water we don't know it's an unpredictable field but my bet is the gap is going to close in the foreseeable future. Okay. And tell me, where do the small language models that we hear about as well to the, the SLMs that you see every now and then as well too, where do they fit into this, this kind of world of, of, of language models, et cetera? Yeah. So obviously the, the whole point of bigger is better is not necessar necessarily true in AI because one thing is, we do need this model to operate on edge devices like cameras out in in, in mm -hmm. out in the sea on, on oil rigs or even on your phone so we tried to, making this smaller models um smaller models are more favorable in terms of uh being leveraging edge devices and at some point 
the accuracy can you can't really tell the accuracy um the accuracy gains from a from a seven billion parameter model and a two billion parameter model especially if you're grounding um mm -hmm. that model in a system such as a rag system essentially what you need is that reasoning capability and that that is emergent in in after you go past a few billion parameters right so mm -hmm. You just need the reasoning capability. And when you have RAG, you're able to ground it in truth. You're able to get very good, accurate responses out of this model. So you might not need a 314 billion parameter model. Excellent. I think that, yeah, it, it, the, the numbers are enormous. And, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think anybody needs that what, that size of model. Well, maybe they do, you know. But you know what? Maybe they do because I'm, I'm, I'm speculating here. But again, the more models you add, the more the more the more emergent abilities we start to see right the the, the more these models are able to perform um better at different tasks and maybe at some point we'll reach to a number that what looks like agi or mm -hmm. consciousness who knows I'm, I'm going into the speculation land there did i mention i don't like speculating <laughs> well i mean yeah look let's not go down that rabbit hole i think you know th that brings a whole load of other questions that which model is going to rule them all who's going to win which company is going to come out the, the most when does agi actually happen when are we going to get that date that the terminator movies have have, have feared us about for so long as well too so yeah. that's a that's another show richmond that's another show <laughs> i was about to plug our own excellent stuff but somebody on linkedin who unfortunately comes through as linkedin user for us i do apologize and maybe that is the case tells us that there's lots of excellent examples that makes it super easy to consume embeddings and computer services and our demo data as you showed at the beginning already has the embedded fields in there as well too so there's the url but simply search for mongodb atlas vector search and you'll get to what you need to do we've loads of examples and there's buttons on that web page as well that takes you straight through to our generative ai use cases and examples of you know, real world and examples of people building Gen AI applications. And I think that's one of the key things for me. And I think in this instance, your demo, your tu you know, the tutorial that you've gone through Richmond, super easy to follow. Every step was massively clear. And, you know, people might come back and say, well, why do I need a movie recommendation? This is just really toe in the water. This is how you work with it. These are the structures that you need. This is This is the way it works. And you can take it from there. And what Richmond and a whole host of the rest of the developer relations team here at MongoDB does is builds tutorials and how-to articles all the time up on our developer center at MongoDB. So if you want to check those out, Richmond has a bunch of articles up there already, which I'm in awe of, because usually we give new people in MongoDB kind of three months grace before we're expecting them to be published content providers. And, you know, Richmond, you've blown us out of the park there. We're really happy to see all the work that you're putting into this space and, and can't wait to see what else you're doing. So developer.mongodb.com is the nice shortcut to get you to our developer center. And there you'll see links to the videos and forthcoming episodes of Cloud Connect and, and others as well, too. Um, so it's all there. You touched on it a little bit. And as a wrap up, where do people, where could we go to learn more as a developer outside of our developer center? Is there any blogs you follow or podcasts you listen to Richmond or anything like that, that you would send people to? So, um, <clears throat> podcast, very interestingly, I listen to one called the all in podcast, very high level, um, summary of what's going on in technology and finance from four interesting characters um that's just both for entertainment and information purposes um but more serious podcasts lex friedman podcast is always good right um mm -hmm. there's a no prior uh no prior uh podcast latent space podcast um <clears throat> those are places i get the information my information from and um i'm subscribed to a few newsletters so much now shane i can't even pull out one all i know is i open my inbox and there are mm -hmm just newsletters and I'm just reading. And I also get my, my my latest information straight from the horse's mouth because I have to listen and tune in to, to, the, to this large uh, language model providers like OpenAI, mm -hmm. Google, 
Untropic, Cohere, and I'm putting my ears out, working with the team over there, the developer team, and just knowing what's actually happening in the space. And yeah, straight straight from the horse's mouth is where you get the best news. But um, podcasts and newsletters, the ones I mentioned, are really good to understand what's happening within the AI community in terms of what tools are people using, how people are advancing, or how people are, are feel about AI and a different perspective on it as well. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. And if you are building anything using MongoDB and you need any help, we have um, great forums. And I know that our engineers and our DevRel folks are on those forums all the time too. And we do have um, a section in there called the AI Collective. So if you're building something and you need a bit of help, or you need a bit of inspiration, do check out our MongoDB forums at community.mongodb.com to check that out a little bit more. And we're more than happy to help. So if you're building something, we'd love to see it. We'd love to share, uh, show you, see what you're building so that we could maybe do some more with it and help you out as well too. And um, this has been superb. Richmond, this is great. I said at the beginning, this is, I think you're, this is your first live stream with us in MongoDB. I know you're a seasoned YouTuber in your own right with your own channel as well too, but this has been superb. Thank you so much for making you know, this topic so clear and so easy to follow. And I think the comments that we're getting in on LinkedIn and YouTube would echo that, that you know, that people have said that this has been super clear, super easy, one of the best streams that we've had. So that's all down to your good self, Richmond. Thank you so much indeed. And, and also you're a great you're a great host, Shane. And I have to give it to the handyman. It was the handyman. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, again, I think for the thanks also goes out to all of our viewers, everybody that joined us again. I think we might have had a small issue with some of the LinkedIn comments. Some of them get through, some of them don't. I'm still seeing 280 plus people on our LinkedIn stream join, still tuned in. So Richmond, that's a testament to how much you've kept their attention and how interesting you've made this topic. So I'd like to thank Richmond, obviously, uh, most importantly for joining us. An ex-boss, and I've said this a few times on the stream, told me the reward for good work is more work. So you're not getting away with not doing one of these again, Richmond. So I'm going to keep an eye on your content output. And when I see something keen and interesting that's valuable food for this show, you're coming back on. No that's doubt about it. And um, for all our viewers, thank you so much. Don't forget, as I said at the beginning, if this is your first time you're on our YouTube channel, please like and subscribe there to the MongoDB YouTube channel. If you're joining us on LinkedIn, please follow MongoDB and you'll get the alerts for shows such as this, but all our other posts and our other news. And as I said, we are just about to start our MongoDB.local season, kicking off essentially in uh, Toronto and New York. And if you go to the MongoDB website, search for MongoDB.local, you'll see the registration page for both of those events. And if you use the code COMMUNITY50, so the word COMMUNITY and then number five, number zero, you'll get 50% off. And if it's not there yet, keep an eye on those pages because we are coming to, I think, 26 or something cities throughout from now, probably till uh, late November. So we will should be coming to a city near you. But for me, Shane McAllister and everybody who helps put these shows together, we do appreciate everything. But ultimately to you, Richmond, Thank you for such an engaging presentation, such an engaging demo, and keeping our couple of hundred viewers active all the way to the end. We love to see that. And great to have you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And thanks, thanks. for listening to you guys. <laughs> no worries. Listen, thank you all. Hope to see you on a future episode of MongoDB TV Cloud Connect. Thank you for joining as ever.